Picking up in the book of Acts. Now, I have titled this set of lessons as the historical stories of the Acts of the Apostles. And the reason why I've done that is because people often to look at the book of Acts and they try to pull theological ideas and truths out of the book of Acts. The reality is we can't do that. In fact, there is not one single uh, theological doctrine that is pulled out of the book of Acts. The book of Acts truly is a book of transition to show how we get from the law into what happened with the church as the church was developing in the age of grace. But it's called the Acts of the Apostles on purpose because it's dealing with the Acts of specifically two apostles. One is Peter and the other is an old Pharisee by the name of Saul of Tarsus who on the road to Damascus will, the Lord will strike him down, make him blind, and choose him to be an apostle out of season. And as we begin going through the Acts of the Apostles, we'll see and we'll start kind of marking a list of what Peter does, and then when we get over to what Paul does, we'll see that they match totally, so that it proves that Paul is truly an apostle out of season. Also, the book of Acts allows us to know a history of how things happen in the storyline. If it wasn't for the book of Acts, we could not go to the rest of the New Testament and know anything about how the, what was part of the first missionary journey, what was part of the second missionary journey, what was part of the third missionary journey, or who did this, or who did that. It would just be all, we would just be doing speculation all over. So the Lord allowed Luke to write down Paul's eyewitness account of what happened with the church as he saw it from a Pharisee and then as a follower, and also, as Luke is traveling around as a Gentile who comes to know the Lord, he starts traveling with uh, Paul as, or Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul as a, his own personal physician, and also as his companion. Well, Paul could read and write many languages, so could Luke. And Luke was a, a very well-deserved addition to Paul's team because Luke will write many of the letters that will come later on. Now, as we start off, in fact, let's just get into it. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. It says, The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things which concern the kingdom of God. Luke opens up and he is writing to a guy by the name of Theophilus. Theophilus is a Greek word that means lover of God. He says, remember in that first account, if you go back to the book of Luke and you look at it, he writes it to Theophilus, the same guy. And he says, in that first account in the book, in, the, in my letter to you about the gospel, about the, the life of Jesus, I wrote everything that he did all the way up to the point of the proofs of his resurrection and to the point of his ascension. And he did, just as we saw in the book of Mark, and Mark did that. Luke did it, and he wrote it to Theophilus. And now he is writing a second account to Theophilus, the same guy. Now, we don't know very much about Theophilus. We can assume that he is a Roman citizen. We can assume that he is a Gentile, and we probably know, those are pretty, two pretty good assumptions. But the one thing we know for sure is that these two letters that Luke wrote to Theophilus, Theophilus allowed them to be copied and circulated throughout all the churches. We also know that these two letters represent almost 28% of the New Testament. Down the footnote number two that I've put down there, the entire New Testament, look at that, the entire New Testament came, contains 184,159 words. In the Gospel of Luke and the letter of the Acts of the Apostles, those contain 51,087 words. That's almost 28%. That is a huge chunk of the New Testament. Now let me tell you the rest of it. When we go over and just do Paul's letters, Paul's letters, 
It's nowhere near 51,000 words. All of Paul's letters, no, even, they, even though it's 13 books, it's nowhere near 51,000 words. And in fact, if you take, if you take uh, from Romans to the end of Revelation and hold your Bible from Matthew through Acts, you're going to find out there's more material from Matthew through Acts than there is from Romans to the Revelation, even though there's a whole lot more books, a whole lot more letters. So Luke is used by the Holy Spirit to record the eyewitness account of that Pharisee by the name of Saul of Tarsus, to write, and he writes it to this guy by the name of Theophilus, who, who means lover of God, but we know nothing else about him, except for the Holy Spirit uses those two letters to continue on to be considered scripture and to be read for instructions throughout the entire churches, all the churches, and it becomes part of the canon of the New Testament. In that first letter, Luke writes the gospel. He writes about the resurrection of the Lord and, and Jesus uh, uh, on that first Sunday, the day he resurrected, he sees all the apostles except, and all the disciples except for Thomas. And, he, and Thomas doesn't see him till the next week, the next Sunday. We see the road to Emmaus. We see him at the, at the Sea of Galilee and he hollers out. He's got a fire going and he says to the to the guys out in the boat, come bring some fish, come, let's dine. Join me in dine for, for a meal. We see all of that. And when we get to the uh, place of the Mount of Olives, we see his ascension there in, and we hear that he goes up. Now in this letter, Luke spends some time to tell them exactly what Jesus said to them and exactly what happens. So let's pick up with that. Uh, he says in verse 4, and gathering them together, he's got all his apostles and he's gathering them together there. He commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for, the fa for, for what the Father had promised, which he said, You heard of, of from me, for John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So he gives the instructions, Y'all go and you wait in Jerusalem and don't leave Jerusalem. Now, this is not the first time the, Jew, the, the Lord has told His followers not to leave Jerusalem. Back in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar is right outside the city. He's been trying to take the city, and, Nebuch and the Lord says to Jeremiah, tell the people not to leave Jerusalem. Anyone who leaves Jerusalem will die. Well, they see Nebuchadnezzar out there, and they head out towards Egypt. Another group heads out towards Syria. Another group heads out towards Asia Minor. Another group heads out towards Italy. Jeremiah gets taken with the group down to Egypt, and Jeremiah's going, oh, no, I'm going to die. Oh, no, I'm going to die. He's a weeping, he's a moaning, he is a whining prophet. You got it? He's crying over his people all the time and the message because nobody's listening to Jeremiah. Finally, he does that so much that the people in Egypt go, well, let's get rid of Jeremiah. Send him back. If he wants to be back in Jerusalem, send him back. Lo and behold, they send him back, and according to the Old Testament passages, guess what happens? Guess what Nebuchadnezzar does to the people who went down to Egypt? They all die. What happened to the ones who went to Syria? They all die. What happened to the ones who went to Italy? They all die. What happened? They all die. Only the ones who remained in Jerusalem were taken into exile and were saved. Their lives were saved. Here Jesus is saying as he gathers them around, don't leave Jerusalem. Go back and stay there and remain there and wait until the promise is given to you, which John proclaimed that promise. John the Baptist proclaimed it and said, hey, the uh, Lord's going to baptize with uh, the Holy Spirit and with fire, by the way, what John the Baptist says, and, G and they're go to go there and wait. Well, let's pick up on page 2 and verse number 6 of your notes. And he, he says, And so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? <laughs> Stop. That just dumbfounds me. Just 47 days before, they are on their way to Jerusalem with the triumphal entry. And James and John, as we know from another one of the Gospels, and his mo their mother is asking Jesus, uh, when you set up this kingdom of Israel, this kingdom of yours, um, when you get into is Jerusalem here, can James sit on one side and John sit on the other? And they're talking about this. And of course, Jesus says, that's not mine to grant. I can't give you that. That's already been set, who's on the right hand and who's on the left hand. That's not mine to give. 
And then they start arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Israel when it's set up. And they don't have a clue. They're out on Mount Olivet. They're standing there. Jesus is resurrected. It's been 40 days since his resurrection, since the Passover. He is standing there, and they're gathered around. He says, go on into Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit to be given. And they say, okay, are we ready for this kingdom of Israel to start? No clue. Absolutely no clue. They don't have an understanding, even though Luke tells us that for the 40 days he explained the scriptures to them so that they would be able to understand it. Would be able is the operative words there because they don't understand it yet. They are not going to understand it until the Holy Spirit comes to be inside of them, and that is not going to happen until we know the day of Pentecost. They don't know when it's going to happen because Jesus says, go and wait, and soon, not many days hence, the, the, the promise that the Father has given to you will happen and that He has given. And that will be the teacher, the helper, the comforter. The Holy Spirit will come to live inside of them permanently, eternally. Well, picking up there, verse 7, And He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by His own authority. Just as he could not grant to them the place of the right or the left, he says, it's not for you to know the times or the epics. It's not for you to know how things are to do at this point in time. It's not for you to know at all. What you need to do now is go and wait. Verse 8, But you shall receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. <laughs> And after he said these things, he lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. He doesn't tell them to go build the church. Do you see that? Back in the 70s and the 80s, which were my beginning years in the ministry, this stuff about church growth was all over. How do you build a church? And, they, and, and, and books were coming out where they were going, and they were writing about how churches were being built. Now, it didn't mean about church buildings being built. It meant about how churches were growing so huge to be large congregations instead of the small, little bitty congregations that were all over. <coughs> church growth. And in all those books, every single one of them, they were saying things like, you need to build a gymatorium where you can have basketball games and volleyball games and, and play um, uh, dodgeball and you need to start baseball teams and you need to do bowling leagues and all this stuff. You got that? All this stuff where you might do a, a little sharing, but there's a whole lot more playing going on. And that was the secret to church growth. Well, the problem is a lot of the churches didn't have the money to do that. So they just sat back and said, we can't grow. That is not the instruction the Lord gave us. In fact, I'm going to offend some of you right now. Look back. He said, you shall be my witnesses. In he told us to be witnesses, folks. You got it? Here's where I'm going to offend you. There's 200 or 210 or something like that in this room right now. If every single one of you, including myself, tomorrow, tomorrow, Walk to somebody that you knew did not belong to the Lord, as, and did not have the Lord as, your savior, as their Savior, and you say, you know, I've been worried about you, that you, your eternity, and I need to introduce you to my Savior who can be your Savior. I bet you half of them would say, yes, I'm ready, because that's all they're waiting for. See, we don't close the deals. We talk all about it. We do all these games with Christ, you know, as Christian groups, but we got people all around us who don't know the Lord, and we don't invite them. So we don't say, will you bow on your knees and ask the Lord to be your Savior? If every one of us did that to tomorrow, we would grow by at least half, if not more than that. Tomorrow. That's church growth. That's building for the kingdom as witnesses, not playing games. And we come to churches like we are here at Sage Mont, and I love this church. And we got stuff going on, so many things, that if you did every single thing, you would die before the week was out of exhaustion. That's a wonderful thing that we have these things. But we are called to be witnesses. It is all about per another person's salvation. Yes, we come to a Bible study hour like we hear that. You hear that, the word Bible study hour? Because it is an hour. <laughs> Actually, an hour and 15 minutes to those of you who like to run out early. 
I see you running too. And there's grace up here. I'll let you go. I'm not like some of these preachers on the north side of town. They'll call you out and say, sit back down. Well, they put their pistol right up there. I don't do that, all right? I don't do that. Now, now some of you are going to figure out, who was that? Well, he's retired, but there was one who would lay his pistol out here in North Shore. Over in North Shore, he'd lay his pistol up there on the pulpit, and he had preached. And if you started to walk in, he said, I think you need to sit back down. You don't need to go yet. But I got to go. You don't need to go. You know, then sit down. Good friend of mine in classes with me at seminary. Yeah, he was a good, great friend. That's the way he was. And his church didn't grow very much, and you know why. <laughs> he had a judge up there just, you know, in a pistol. Well, they were standing there, and, and, and he says, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. That's what we're to be, witnesses. Well, I didn't really offend you, did you? Did I? I'll get you in a few minutes, I promise. <laughs> Forty days have gone on, and they're waiting for this helper to come along. <laughs> Verse 10. They've seen Jesus go in the sky. I wonder how high that cloud was off the ground. When Jesus lifted up his hands and he went, ooh, I, ooh, if I wasn't a believer yet, I'd be one. You know, ooh. And they received him into the cloud and, and they're standing there in a stupor. Now I got to tell you about stupors. I just got to tell you about that. Because one happened Friday. And it took me back to one that happened 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I showed up here at Sagemont Church and I... And I said to Bill Cole, they were doing the promise. I said, Bill, let me build that scenery for you. And if any of y'all were here 20 years ago, you remember that huge, tall scenery went up to 30 feet up into the auditorium. I built it all and we painted it. And I am up there and I've got this sponge and I am dipping it in three different colors of paint, a triple loading this sponge so that I can pull down to make wood looking look. And I turn around and Larry Dyke is standing right behind me. I can't even load that sponge right. I'm, 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 I'm just like, you know, what do you say when Larry Dyke shows up? You know, what, what do you say? When you're trying to draw something, what do you say when Larry, you know, just... You understand? You've been there. Same thing happened on, on Friday afternoon. I'd finished the lesson. We'd finished editing it. And one of our dear ladies who's in this class, and I'm going to point her out to you because I want you to know this story. Deanne Leach is right here. She came to see me. And De Deanne is a wonderful person, and she was 75 years old when she came to know the Lord. And I'm proud of that. She is like a five-year-old. You know how a five-year-old, everything you hear, they, I mean, everything you do with them, they just go, and they can do it? Well, she hasn't got anything else to do but learn about God at 75. And she's just, and I am enjoying it so much. Over the holidays, she got ill and had to go to the hospital. And her son comes down in, and I'm worried, and we're making phone calls, trying to find out what's going on. And um, so, you know, Sally tells me, well, her son is Richard Leach, and, and okay, don't think anything about it. And so Friday, she's in my office, and she says to me after we talk, she says, you know, my son's a singer. And things started clicking in my head. How old's your son? She told me. Well, he's about my age. And I start clicking because, you know, I remember, I, I, I ponder on my past because it helps me today and in the future. And, I, and I'm thinking, Richard Leach, Richard Leach, I remember when I was at Kilgore hearing about this incredible guy who was an incredible tenor with this incredible voice. It was just incredible. Just Can I say the word incredible again? And it was all over in every college about this kid this kid my age who's just going to go to the top. Finally, after the conversation, I, and I, I said, your son, where does he live? And she said, well, he's in New York. And I said, is your son Richard Leach, the Richard Leach with the Metropolitan Opera? And she goes, yes, that's him. <laughs> I'm dumbfounded. I'm in a stupor. I'm in an awe. She might as well have left my office right then because I can't think straight. I just can't. She does leave my office, and I start dialing up U2s of Richard Leach and listening to him. And I'm going, this is him. This is a kid who has his de debut in the Metropolitan Opera at 21 years of age. And then I find this little site with one little YouTube where they've, there's this passage, this phrasing that happens in the, in, in the opera Faust, where they, he has to, they have to sing a high C. 
and they have 15 tenors on there. They start with Caruso with this little kind of scratchy recording, and they go all through with Placido Domingo and Pavarotti and all within. Guess who's in the list? Richard Leach. Go look it up on YouTube and say who's the best when you hear it. He's the best. He is the best. I'm trying to fix my wife's washing machine. I'm looking on the web to find out how to get this thing open to fix the transmission on the washing machine. And over here, I got the YouTube going, just click, 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 click. And I'm listening to it, and I can't do nothing. I'm in a stupor. <laughs> I said to her before she left, and this is, a, this is true. I said, if I had a voice like your son has, I'm afraid I would have not have come to know the Lord. Didn't I say that? I did say that. I would have. <laughs> Yes, that's what you said. <laughs> I find this one YouTube, you've got to hear this. This one YouTube where he is at the Atlantic, he's backstage at the Atlantic Opera House, and he's got his guitar. And he's talking about how, how he does opera, but he does all sorts of music. And he's got his guitar, he's going, mm, Don't know why there's no stars up in the sky. And I'm going, <laughs> And then he sings this country western thing. And I'm going, and I'm listening to him. I'm in a stupor. You've all been that way with somebody. Every one of you have stood around somebody that you're in their presence and they put on their pants just like you do and they struggle with finances just like you do. Everything in the world, but you just sit there going, oh, do you know who they are? <laughs> now, it's been a long time since I have had that feeling. But she gave it to me and it reminds me of my frailties. It really does. These men of Galilee were standing on the Mount of Olivet and they're looking at Jesus who's gone in the sky and they're standing there in this stupor. <sighs> Jesus doesn't let them stand there very long before He sends them a message. That's what's so good about God. He's going to give you a message whether you do it right or not. Verse 10. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while He was departing, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come just in the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. What are you doing, guys? He told you where to be. He's gone. Get on over there in Jerusalem. They waited too long. They looked in a stupor too long. He didn't know what to do. He had already told them what to do. Go wait in Jerusalem until the helper is given to you not many days hence. He says, and by the way, great, great prophecy here. Just as you saw him leave, he's going to return. We hadn't heard that before. You got that? That's brand new. We hadn't heard it. It's new to what they know. We can go to Jerusalem and, they, and the Mount of Olives and they can try to tell us where Jesus' feet left, but we don't know. But I'm going to tell you something. The Lord knows where his feet left. And he went up through the skies and through the, into the clouds. And we know from other passages that he will come and break through the clouds and come back to the very place he left, left, his, feet, left his feet off the next time he returns. Man, that's good stuff. Verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room. Yes, the same upper room where they had had the Lord's Supper. All of them went in. It wasn't a very big room from this stage. Probably a room about yay big. That's where they went in. Not very big. Where they went in to recline. They went in to wait there and they waited there. Who all was there? Here it tells us. He doesn't, he doesn't want us to be ignorant. He said there was Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, Judas the son of James. All of these with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Jesus' brothers. James is there. James was not a follower of the Lord while his half-brother Jesus was alive. But when his half-brother Jesus came out of that grave and saw him, he became a convert. In fact, he's going to become the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. He's going to write our letter called the book of James. He's going to write the letter in Acts chapter 15 that tells us we've made the decision has been made. A Gentile doesn't have to become fully Jew to be a Christian. We've got his words. 
He's a follower along with Jonas, his brother, and the other brothers. All become followers of the Lord when his resurrected. They just thought he was out doing this thing. They didn't believe that he could be who he was. They didn't know where all this miraculous power had come from before because they didn't see it for the first 30 years of his life. Well, they, come, they began to believe it then. Well, they're all there, and they're in that upper room. And from Mount Olivet over to the upper room or to Jerusalem, it's about a Sabbath day's journey. Now, I just had to put this in uh, because I, I wanted you all to uh, know about this because it's a man-made thing. Over in Exodus chapter 16... Uh, it tells us, that's down in your footnotes, I put it there in a footnote for you. <clears throat> the Lord told the folks in the wilderness not to travel on the Sabbath, but to rest. He didn't tell them you can travel a Sabbath day's journey and that's okay. When they're in the wilderness and they're marching around Sinai and all of that, uh, he just says, on the Sabbath, I want you to wait. So to wherever they were when the Sabbath came, they just were to rest. And we know from Jesus' teaching that he's just got, got through doing in the past few months. He said, listen, the Sabbath is made for man. Man is not made for the Sabbath. In other words, man is to rest on the Sabbath, not be bound by resting on the Sabbath. That's the reason when Jesus went through and he, he got the grains of wheat and they began to eat them on the Sabbath. That broke the law of man but didn't break the law of God because you got to eat on the Sabbath. You do, you just rest. He wants you to rest. Well, it's interesting in that that's all the Old Testament tells. It doesn't say anything about a Sabbath day's journey in God's instruction. Well, if you remember, Moses was trying to uh, con judge everything going on and his father-in-law comes along and says, Moses, why don't you go and get 70 of the elders from all the people and let them be judges and you be the 71st first vote. If they can't judge, it's a 35-35 tie, you break the tie. Well, Moses goes and does that without the instruction of the, law, of the Lord. The Lord doesn't tell him to do that. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. You know, the Lord really is gracious. Uh, we do things that we shouldn't do and He still uses us anyway. You ever caught that? We do things that are totally out of His will that He didn't give us instruction to do and He still uses us within just a few minutes or days to do what he, His will is. Moses sets that up and we know that becomes a Sanhedrin. And instead of Moses casting the vote, a high priest casts the vote if there's a tie. Well, along the way, but the 1,400 years between the Exodus and Jesus' death on the cross, 1,475 to be exact, the Sanhedrin comes up with this sets of laws. Well, I tell you what, a Sabbath day's journey, that's 2,000 cubics or 3,000 feet. Got that? 2,000 cubics or 3,000 feet. You can travel that. So that was the law to begin with. Then later on, they kind of changed it. They said, well, we got a problem here. We get them out 2,000 feet, they got to come home. So it's okay for them for a Sabbath day's journey to go out 2,000 feet on a Sabbath day's journey and return home. That was good. Then they changed it again. You know, if on the day before the Sabbath, you go out here and you put a piece of bread and some food 2,000 feet out, on the Sabbath day, you can go out 2,000 feet, stop, eat a meal, thus establishing a new home for yourself, and then you can go 2,000 more feet. That worked for a while. Then they realized we have the same problem we had before. They are out now 4,000 feet and they got to get home. So they changed the law again. Go out 2,000 feet, eat your bread, go 2,000 feet, and then you can come all the way back home or 12,000 12, feet, 4,000 cubics, what you could get, okay? Well, here's the interesting thing. <clears throat> From the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem, it is 4,854 feet. It doesn't fit any of this. And Luke says, okay, it's about a, Sab about a Sabbath day's journey of 4,852 feet. Hmm, okay. Doesn't fit any of this. It's less than this, but it's more than this. So then we've got these folks who come along and say, okay, a Sabbath day's journey is 4,854 feet. See how legalistic that is? 
This is all man-made. It's all man-made. It's all, nothing, none of it's God. The re reality is, is the Lord says, hey, if you've got to go over here because you've got a problem, go. But I'd rather you're resting on the Sabbath. You follow it? Because the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. <laughs> well, they get back from Jerusalem. They go get in that upper room, and there they are waiting. And they're all there, and they're waiting, and they're praying that the Holy for, for uh, devoting themselves to prayer. And, it's, and the days are going along, and it's going to take ten days. We know that, but they don't know when this is going to happen. And Peter gets impetuous again. Impetuous Peter. Allah, foot in the mouth, and do something that is against what the Lord wants. Listen to what he does. And at that, this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, and he said, Brethren... The scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning, concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. And he was counted among us and received his portion in this ministry. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his homestead be made desolate, and let no man dwell in it, and his office let another man take. It is therefore necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these should become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they put forward two men, Joseph called Barsabbas and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, who knows the hearts of, the, of all men, show which one of these two thou hast chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles." The Lord never told Peter to make that message, to give that message. He got up on his own. He goes over to Psalms chapter 69. He finds some passages that prove that Judas' place has to be, Judas has to be replaced. So he gets up and they select two guys who've been with them since, since John the Baptist was, was baptizing, six months before Jesus starts his ministry. These two men have all the same credentials that all the other apostles have. And they put them up and they, they pray to God. Now thou, O Lord, select for us the one that you want. In other words, rubber stamp what we're doing. And let us select the one that's going to take Judas' place. And then they rolled the dice. Or they pulled straws. Or they did something. Here's where you're going to be offended again, some of you. I just love this part. Do you know there is absolutely no place anywhere in the scripture where the people, when they voted, they made the right choice? Not one. They're two years and 11 days out of Egypt. They're, they've got the law, they've got the covenants, they've got the tabernacles, they've got the ark, they've got the manna, they've got everything. They're ready to go into the promised land. Two years and 11 days. They're at Kadesh Barnea. <clears throat> they send spies over. The spies come back and say, Oh! The land is filled with milk and money. I mean, honey. <laughs> honey was just as good as money back those. You know that? It's filled with food. It's prosperous. <clears throat> Joshua and Caleb say, let's go get them. Let's go. Let's take them. The ten other spies say, no, there's giants over there. I think we need to have a vote. So they took a vote. And you remember the scripture? And it was unanimous not to go. So God, understanding that His people had voted unanimously not to go when He had them ready to go, you remember what He said. Like coaches, you don't do the thing right. <laughs> the coach says, go take a lap, son. Take a lap for 38 years until everyone who is 20 years and older dies and I will bury them in the desert and the younger generation I will take into the promised land. <clears throat> they rolled every, every time in the scripture where you see them casting lots and rolling dice it's never a good thing never a good thing God calls a minister to lead Moses was there to lead Moses goofed up because he let them vote 
They took a vote. He should not have done that. He should have been a leader and led them into the promised land. But no, they wanted to vote, so they voted. God puts a leader in a church, and that leader is to lead the church. That's what it's for. Now some of y'all, in fact most of y'all, have been in little churches where you voted on every single thing. And you know now why it was a little church. And you also know why there was almost everybody was related by blood who was still in the church. And the people who were not related by blood didn't know any difference about anything in the world. They were just peripheral, just there, okay? Because it was a church. Why? Because God puts a shepherd in the church to shepherd the people and to feed them and to tend them for that purpose. Hmm. Verse 1. Finally what happens, and when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Stop. We, we experienced this a few nights ago. We have these big old huge pot plants out by our swimming pool. They're in pots about yay big and about yay tall, and they're only just bushes and stuff like that. And we went out and watered them so they'd be nice and heavy and get through the cold in the winter. And we woke up the next morning. You know where all those pot plants were? In the swimming pool. Yes, sir. Yes, that's where they were. They've been blown over into the swimming pool. And that sound that came, it took our Christmas tree down out there that was guaranteed for so many miles an hour. Well, whatever it was, there was more miles an hour than what, what it was. And that tree went down out there. And that wind and that noise that blew, it was like a hurricane sound or like a tornado. <laughs> but it's in the room with them. You got that? It's in, their, in the room. They're, they're there in this little room and this noise is like a violent, mighty rushing wind is in the noise. And verse 3 says, And there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. The second miracle is this fire comes and it's got these tongues that go out and each one of them touches onto one of the people. And it's like fire, but it's not fire. Now, they shouldn't be surprised by this. They shouldn't be surprised. Before I go back to the verse 4, look on the next page where I've got Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11. John the Baptist, before even Jesus came along, prophesied this. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Fire, but not fire. You remember Moses is out in the land of Midian. He's shepherding sheep, and he looks up and he sees a bush that is on fire, but it's not burning, is it? It's not consumed. And who speaks from the midst of that burning bush? God. For 40 years, they're surrounding, the, in the wilderness, they're surrounding Mount, Mount Zion, and they're just going around it, just going around it. And as they look up on the top of the mountain, they see it doing what? It is burning. But it's not burning, because it can't burn for 40 years constantly, because there's not enough stuff there. And whenever they're burning, who's up there? The presence of God. All throughout Jewish literature, the old, it, when God shows up, there's fire, but not fire, but like fire that's present. And on the day of Pentecost, just like what John the Baptist says and like what has happened in the past, these tongues like a fire touch each one of them. Mm, verse 3. And there, um, verse 4. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. When that tongue touched them, the Holy Spirit came inside of them to live permanently. They began to speak in other tongues. That is, not a, that is not an unknown tongue. It's other tongues. It is known languages. As the Spirit was giving them utterance. Wow. Known like Three miracles are happening. The wind, the tongues, I mean the, the, the fire and the tongues. They begin, these men are Galileans. They speak a rough Aramaic and a rude Koine Greek. They don't speak anything right. Most of them can't read and most of them can't write. And now they're speaking in other languages. So look what happens. Look on um, uh, page 5, down on verse 5. He says, And there, was, there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. 
And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because they were each hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and marveled, saying, Why, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each, uh, uh, how, how that we each hear them in our own tongue, or our own language, in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Edomites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the district of Libya around Cyrene. Remember Simon of Cyrene was there, the guy that carried the cross from there. The visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongue speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, They are full of sweet wine. The tongues have touched them in the rooms. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit. They begin having the ability to speak in other known languages and they go out into the streets of Jerusalem and they begin telling the gospel of what the God has done. And people who are there from every nation under heaven. This is not even all the nations that he has mentioned, every nation of heaven, but he's telling specifically the ones that he knows about. This is very important. We catch what happens when Peter gives his next message. He's got the Holy Spirit now, so it's his first message that he gives after the Holy Spirit's indwelt him, and over 3,000 are going to come to know the Lord that day. But we miss what happens. And that's the reason why I've paused here before we go on, and we're not going on this week to verse 14 where Peter gives the message. That's going to happen next week. We pause here because I want you to understand the importance of what is happening here. Every nation under heaven. I've got a list there for you, and I want to show you where these countries are. When it says Parthia, that is southern Iran, which is right in here. It says Mede, that's northern Iran, which is right in here. We've got the Himalayan mountains coming across. You got that? Elam, that's over here, what we call Jordan today. We've got Mesopotamia. That's what we call Iraq today, but it actually went up higher than Iraq like that. We've got Judea. That is the center where Jerusalem is. By the way, by the way, when Luke lines these out, he lines them out according to the four corners of the world. And he lines out by going to the eastern ones first. And then he comes to the north. Then we go down to the south and then to the west. And then he comes back and he adds these back here and the ones that come up by water. To the Jew, and in fact, if you go back and find a copy of an English translation from early days, they didn't translate the word north, south, east, or west. To a Jew, and to the Jewish world, if you go forward, you always are looking to the east. If you go backwards, you're always looking to the west. When it says that they turned, they, when he talked about Joshua and they went backwards, you, we think about their retreating. No. In the scripture, it's just telling us which direction they're going. They're going west. If they go to the left, they're going north. If they're going uh, to the right, they're going south. Our newer translations know this, and so they talk about the kingdom from the north. The kingdom of Gog, who's going to come in the middle of the tribulation time, is the king of the north. In the older tra English translations, it's the king of the left. You got that? Just like in the words, we've got the word Baptist of John the Baptist. In those older translations prior to 1611, it was John the Immerser, because the word Baptist wasn't to baptize wasn't a word. It was a Greek word that we had to pull over when King James, the irreverent King James, did not like the word baptized because they had a water shortage in England at that time and people were dying of the plague that was going through and he didn't want people going and baptizing in the water. So he made the committee, the, the committee of the Bible, 32 committees presented Bibles to King James and he selected one of them. 31 other copies were out there so they called the one copy he selected the authorized copy by King James. By a guy who was a, I don't, let me just put it this way, I don't think we're going to see King James when we get into the pearly gates because he was not a godly man whatsoever. Well, Luke lays this out. East over here, then north and west. Okay, so we've got um, 
We've got southern Iran, we've got northern Iran, we've got Mesopotamia, we've got Jordan, we've got Judea area, that's where we are. Cappadocia is in here. We've got Pontius in here. We've got Asia in this part right here. We've got Phrygia right in here. We've got Pamphylia up in here. We've got Egypt, which actually spanned down to about there during that time. We've got the district of Libya and Cyrene, which spanned about right there. We've got Rome, but when they talk about Rome, the scripture, it's not talking about Rome the city. It's talking about the Roman Empire, where the Roman Empire catches all of this, including its newfound group of islands that it's taken over called Britannia. So this is the Roman Empire. It's covering about like this by now. We've got Crete, which is that little island right there. And we've got Arabia, which is Saudi Arabia now today. This is the known world. These are just representative. Now here's the important thing we miss. On the day of Pentecost, which we're going to study next week, the, the message, 3,000 people from this, these areas come to know the Lord. They've got to go home. At the furthest out, it will take them 90 to 120 days. But let's just say it takes them 90 days. 90 days from the day of Pentecost, these people from these countries return, and what do they take with them? Jesus. Within 90 days after Pentecost, the known world according to... And, and by the way, by this time, here's an interesting fact. The year that Christ dies is the year that Buddha is taken to China, not before. China is not a Buddhist country before Calvary. It happens the year of Calvary happens. Yes, by this time, people have already come in. They've already come over. They've gone over the Bering Strait to Alaska. They've come back down. They've come through America. We've got Indians down here. We've got all that. They've already gone down into uh, South America. By this time, the Mayan Indians have already come and gone. You following the time schedule here? Interesting fact. Come and gone. We're not, no more. We got all the, we've got people all over. They've gone by boats over here to Japan. They've gone by boats to these islands in Indonesia. They've gone by boats over to uh, Australia. Somebody, a Jew, was here in Jerusalem from every area of the world because they had come to celebrate the Feast of Harvest at that all-important day that had been established whenever they left e Egypt in the Exodus. And they were there for that all-important purpose. Well, what made it so interesting is every one of them heard the message of Jesus Christ delivered to them in their own language, linguistically perfect. And they asked the question, aren't these men of Galilee? Galileans were rough. They were rude. They didn't speak the language well. And they're hearing the message perfectly in their language. It's a miracle of the wind. It's a miracle of the fires. It's a miracle of the tongues. And it's a miracle of the ears. Hearing it perfectly. Now, only two other times in the book of Acts and in the New Testament will we see the same thing happen again. And in both those other two times, and I've got those in the footnotes for you, both those other two times it is for the purpose of proving to a Jew that a Gentile can be accepted by the Lord and have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of him. And after that, we see it no more, not any place else, after the end of the book of Acts. We only see it two times. And so, with that, this is, this is how the gospel works. It's been pretty expiring and inspiring, and we like to talk about Peter getting up, but our time is up. So it's time for us to go. So if you want to hear about Peter's, Peter's first real message indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you've got to come back next week. <laughs> Lord, we thank you that even like Peter who messed up and tried to replace Judas with one of those two guys, Lord, if, if you'd wanted one of those guys, you'd already picked them. And we know that later on you're going to pick the replacement and you're going to do it with, with your own choice. <laughs> but even as Peter messed up, you turned around and used Peter within the next few days in a miraculous way. That gives us great hope because we mess up too and we know we've messed up. And we turn around and you still use us in miraculous ways. 
Our hearts are towards you, Lord. May we be witnesses for you in the days to follow, as well as today. In your son's name, amen.